Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. As the images in the opening of this program flash before you, you saw different aspects of the journey, focusing on Christ and, and the Holy Father and the church and other issues. And I want to draw your attention to the image of the church that was there, because tonight's topic, theme, will be the church in the Old Testament. Christian believers all over the world have different ideas of the church and its importance, when it started, whether it's necessary, or whether we can just have me and Jesus theology. And my guest this evening, Jeff Childers, right? Jeff Childers, uh, it was the issue of the church in the Old Testament. I don't mean the church and the Old Testament, but the church in. The image of the church as expressed through the writings of the Old Testament that opened his heart to the church. And Jeff was a former Church of Christ minister. So he'll talk about his own journey in a moment. Remember, you're an important part of this program. So call your questions to Jeff at 1-800-221-9460. Or you can send us an email at journeyhome at EWTN.com. Jeff, welcome to the Journey Home. Thank you. Happy to be here. You know, I mentioned that you were a former Church of Christ minister. And uh, am, I, am I correct to say that that's not very often that Church of Christ men and women convert to the Catholic Church. No, not very often at all. I, I know of a handful both before and after me, but when I converted, I didn't know of any who'd done it before me. That's right. I know a couple actually been on the program, uh, uh, and uh, I actually hope to have them back again because their, their witness is so uh, powerful. Mm -hmm. And maybe we'll talk a little bit later if we have time about why is that, sure. that our too many Church of Christ converts to the church. But let's begin where we always begin. Share with the audience a little bit of your early spiritual journey. Okay. Well, what you're going to hear is the beginning of the beginning of my journey, because <laughs> I'm still in the beginning of my journey. The, the end goal of the journey is complete union with the love of Christ in heaven. Yeah. Um, but my journey began in 1956. Now, you might look at me and say, Jeff, you're 21 years old. <laughs> uh, is this the new math or something? But, uh, no, it was my grandmother was a Catholic who had married outside of the church. Mm. And uh, shortly before she ended up leaving the church for the Church of Christ, which was my grandfather's denomination, uh, she held my infant father in her arms and said a prayer dedicating him to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Well, within a few months, she had left the Catholic Church and joined the Church of Christ, and that family was raised in the Church of Christ. And when I was born, I was raised in, in the Church of Christ. Uh, the strongest influence in my early faith was my grandfather. My grandfather is a very strong, good Christian man, uh, insists that, insisted that I would learn the Bible and attend church. And so I did, and I came to love Scripture. I came to love the, the church family that I found there in the Church of Christ. Very small congregation, 120 people, but a very strong, yeah. close-knit family. Um, I was baptized and gave my life to Jesus when I was nine years old, baptized by full immersion uh, for the forgiveness of my sins, though, because the Church of Christ shares with the Catholic Church that yeah. belief that baptism is for forgiveness of sins. Uh, I always wanted to be a preacher. And when I was 11 years old, I preached my first sermon. Uh, it, we had a tradition in the church where on the fourth Sunday night of each month, one of the men in the church would give the, uh, the sermon, the homily for that night. And uh, my topic was God's judgment on the nations. And I looked in the Old Testament where God had destroyed all the nations that troubled Israel. <laughs> and I said, if the United States doesn't shape up and uh, become uh, a culture more open to life, well, then we got the same thing to look forward to when I was 11 years old. I see the beauty of the 11-year-old innocence, uh, <laughs> not politically correct, but right. <laughs> telling right. it like it is. By no means politically correct. <laughs> um, so anyway, I, I really wanted to be a minister in this church, and uh, I was given the opportunity to, to study for that. We didn't have seminaries, but what I would do is basically sit at a master's feet. I was an apprentice under our preacher, David, uh, and worked full-time for two years when I was 16 and 17, studying under him, learning how to preach practically, uh, conducting Bible studies and things like that. And it was right at that point that we'll get to uh, <laughs> that, that I was opened up to the Catholic Church. Now, the, you mentioned the issues about your great-grandmother. And I, it fascinates me because it was after I became a Catholic later on that I discovered that, that if we go back three generations to my great-grandfather, mm -hmm. that he had married outside the church. And I've calculate that's probably when we, our family left. Had you known that about your great grandmother, your grandmother? It was my time? grandmother. I, I, did, I did know that she was Catholic. I knew that all along. Um, so it, it, was, it wasn't okay. a surprise. But. All right, you knew that. And, that. and that your grandfather, your father or mother had been dedicated? Uh, um, my father. No, I didn't learn that one until later. Okay. 
Isn't that interesting the way prayers are eventually answered? Yes. And some still need to be answered, right? Yeah. Well, it, it helps to have the mother of God watching your back. That's right. If we look at this theme of church in the Old Testament, now look back, there you are, a young Church of Christ minister, preaching, seeing things through the, the lenses of the Church of Christ. Mm -hmm. How did you understand the church in the Old Testament? Well, or maybe even un you understand the Old Testament images. Right. There wasn't much talk about the church in the Old Testament, even though we were very big on the Old Testament itself and seeing Christ in the Old Testament. Uh, salvation history was very important to us, and I would go through salvation history with prospective converts mm -hmm. and show them how the, the scriptures always foretold that the Messiah would come, and when he did, he would bring salvation, and that, that Messiah was Jesus Christ who died for our sins. Uh, but as far as the church goes, it was as if all along Christ had been prophesied, and then when he finally came, oh, by the way, there's a church. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, according to our uh, apostasy and restoration theory. The Church of Christ. Maybe. The Church of Christ, yes. Uh, the church had fallen away very early, uh, had adopted pagan practices or, or however it was explained. And the true church ceased to exist, only to be restored, uh, according to Church of Christ, only to be restored in the 19th century. Yeah. So uh, the, the church really didn't figure very big in, in our look at the Old Testament. That view is very common among especially fundamentalist groups, that at some point in time, the church went, became corrupt and completely got off track. When it's dated, right, is all over the place. Mm. Oh yeah, I've seen in writings from, from the Churches of Christ and from other, uh, other Protestant groups that, that want to pinpoint a, a time where the Catholic Church became apostate, all sorts of dates from the, the turn of the second century all the way up through uh, 1054, the schism with the East, <laughs> and any date in between. The, the, the strangest of all was 606 AD, where uh, supposedly, according to one author, Pope Boniface III created the Catholic Church and was the first pope. <laughs> he's the third, but he's the first pope. Right, right. Very interesting. All right. Well, then, all right, what opened your heart to the Catholic Church? Because you're now a, a, a practicing Church of Christ minister as a staff. Probably. Right, okay. right. I, I was, at this time, I was employed full-time. Uh, for, for the first year, I would work under our preacher, David, and, and learn under him and help him and conduct Bible studies. Uh, in the meantime, he, he didn't leave our church, but he, he moved to another congregation to serve. And there was an interim period before the new preacher would come. So for a time, I, was, I wasn't the only preacher in the church, but I was the only one there to you know, yeah. answer the phones. <laughs> um, and so during that time uh, is when I became open to the Catholic Church. It began in 1996 when I came across a book called Will the Real Heretics Please Stand Up, uh, written by David W. Burkhardt, who identified himself as an evangelical Protestant. I, I found out later he was an Anglican priest. Mm -hmm. Must have been a, a low church uh, mm -hmm. type of Ang Anglicanism, but he identified himself as evangelical. What this book set out to do was challenge his fellow evangelicals to reevaluate their teachings, their doctrines, and their practices in light of the writings of the early church fathers. Now, I had always loved the church and I'd always loved history, but I'd never thought much about church history and I had never heard of an early church father before. And so I was fascinated as I read the writings of these people who would give their lives for Jesus, who would dedicate themselves so completely to him, mm -hmm. uh, really our ancestors in the faith, and I became mm -hmm. proud to be part of that. Mm -hmm. Now, this book was, you know, and I don't mean anything against Mr. Burkhop, right. but the book was rather selective in the excerpts from the fathers that it chose to present. and so. I was very much convinced that I was part of exactly what had been in the beginning and had later fallen away. Yeah. But uh, thanks be to God, uh, that inspired me to go out and read more of the Church mm -hmm. Fathers and more For of the For example, history. what topics did it emphasize? Well, it emphasized uh, the, the approach of the Church Fathers to free will and predestination. Now, in the Church of Christ, we followed the school of Arminius, which meant that we recognized man has a free will and we didn't reject predestination, but rejected the, the Calvinist emphasis yeah. on double predestination and mm -hmm. things of that effect. It stressed that baptism was for forgiveness of sins, uh, baptismal regeneration, which was a doctrine that we held, not alone among Protestants, but mm -hmm. uh, peculiar enough among Protestants that, that it separated us from some of, some of our brethren uh, in that way, and was also common to the Catholic mm. Church. So it's interesting, uh, those I know others, one, others that you've mentioned, that that book, quoting from the early church fathers, but as you said, selectively, emphasized a number of doctrines which, I don't, don't want to say coincidentally, but uniquely also confirmed the ones that the Church of Christ happened to also right. confirm, which was right. all, conf but, but it didn't 
it didn't deal with some other doctrines that were very common in the Right. For instance, uh, Mr. Burkhart never mentioned anything about the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist or about apostolic succession or a three-tiered hierarchy with priests, bishops, deacons, none of that, I guess. Which is clear in the early church fathers. But what's interesting is that because he didn't deal with that, then the things that he did confirm were the ones that you confirmed as a Church of Christ. So it was interesting the way the Lord worked in that right. for that right. step in your journey to confirm your Church of Christ but yet open your horizon. Because right. if the book hadn't have done that, I might have put it down. You know, if yeah. the book came right out and said, Real Presence of Christ in the Eucharist and Intercession of Saints, well, I want nothing to do with that. That's, yeah. that's papism. That's <laughs> not for me. <laughs> but it opened you to the Church of Fathers. It did. It did. Um, and as I began to read the Church Fathers and see that these earliest Christians giving their life for Jesus, with whom I'd already begun to identify myself, were indeed Catholic. That made an impression on me. You know, it wasn't overnight. This is a, this is a year and a half long process. But uh, it really opened my heart to Catholicism in a couple ways that I didn't realize their significance <laughs> at first. One instance was uh, when I was 16 years old. Uh, I became convinced that the canon of Old Testament Scripture that Catholics use is the correct canon. And now, of course, the canon of Old Testament Scripture that Catholics use includes seven books and parts of books that Protestants reject. Uh, we call them the Deut Deuterocanonical books. They call them the Apocrypha. Right. Um, on a Sunday morning, the first and last time I was ever invited to preach on a Sunday morning in my home church, I got up and <laughs> preached that uh, the Church of Christ should start using the Catholic Old Testament canon. I had no idea I was becoming Catholic. It didn't even dawn on me. But just this one issue, uh -huh. um, because we'd rejected everything except the Bible, why, if we happen to agree with the Catholic Church on something, so be it. Now, very quickly, uh, an elder in our church, uh, Dean Sullins, a man I love, the man who baptized me, uh, got up and said, well, uh, Jeff, we're going to have to take issue with you on that one. <laughs> uh, but that was, I found that interesting. Interesting seed planted at that point. And then a little later, uh, I'm from Joliet, Illinois, uh, just south of Chicago, when uh, Cardinal Bernadine passed away. Uh, something inside of me, which I believe was the Holy Spirit, moved me to uh, pray for him after he'd passed away, which was something that was not part of the Church of Christ <laughs> tradition, praying for the dead. And I'm reminded of how uh, uh, Kimberly Hahn in, in Rome Sweet Home speaks of how she first prayed the rosary and she told God, I'm sorry if this offends you, Lord, but I feel I have to do this. Well, I prayed the same thing. Lord, I'm sorry if it offends you that I'm praying for the dead. I know our fates are sealed when we leave this world. And also, I'm sorry if it offends you that little old me is praying for uh, a man so great as uh, Cardinal Bernadine who taught us all how to die with dignity. But uh, I did that and I, I prayed for his soul. And just being able to do that, to take a step in that direction, opened my heart even further. Mm -hmm. Uh, to the beauty of Catholicism. Um, the major thing, the major thing that did it for me though, was discovering the church and the priesthood in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. That it was not just, the Old Testament didn't just foreshadow Jesus Christ as Messiah coming, and it did, it does that. Mm -hmm. But not only is he to come and save our souls individually, he is to come and establish us into one covenant family and kingdom. Mm -hmm. And then out of that community, to choose certain men to be a sacrificial priesthood. Hmm. And once I saw that in the Old Testament, I knew, well, uh, I've got to do something. <laughs> I've got to do something because, because this is different. This, what the Old Testament is telling me is supposed to happen, that's not where I am. Hmm. And so I began to think, here we've got a church that traces itself all the way back to these early Christians who believes and practices uh, with, with only natural developments, the same faith handed on by the apostles to these men who then died for their testimony. A church which fulfills what the Old Testament says is going to happen mm -hmm. uh, to create a visible, uh, hierarchical kingdom and, and family here on earth and to have men in that family be sacrificial priests. I'm not entirely sure if it's true yet, but if it's true, I want that. I want to be a part of that. And at the same time the rumblings began, if this sacrificial priesthood this priesthood that the apostles handed down to their earliest successors. If this is true, why well, I, I want to be part of that too. So in July of 1997, uh, I decided that, um, that I couldn't wait any longer. My conscience uh, told me I had to enter the Catholic Church. So I resigned from the Church of Christ. And in doing that, I didn't reject anything yeah. of, of my background. Right. I love the Church of Christ. I speak, it, speak of it only as a profoundly positive experience. Right. It was there that I first met Jesus, first was introduced to the scriptures, uh, received baptism, uh, learned of Christian love and what it meant to really follow after Jesus. 
but I had to take that and move to where the Spirit was pulling me. Mm -hmm. So I uh, left the Church of Christ and began the RCIA program in the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Now, I was received into the church on April of 1998, but in October of 1997, uh, that's when I first knocked on the door of uh, Father John Regan, the vocation director for the Diocese of Joliet, uh -huh. and uh, met with him, spoke with him, went through the grueling interview process with several priests and psychologists and, and whatnot and was accepted after uh, they wanted me to do a year of work after I was accepted into the church, a year of, of work in the church. And I did that and then uh, began studying for the priesthood of the Diocese of Joliet at Conception Seminary College in August of 1999. And so everything had come together just perfectly. Uh, Mary, who had, to whom my family had been dedicated, had been watching over us. <laughs> and then the doubts came. Then came the doubts and the shaking in my vocation and, um, you know, you got to take doubts seriously, but unfortunately what I did is I just kind of juggled with them and played with them to where there was a little voice in my head which pretty much said, priesthood? Yeah. I mean, no. I mean, yeah. And so I got scared and I, I turned Jonah. And uh, after my first year in seminary, which was a great experience, and I, I love the men there, uh, but I thought, well, uh, I really need to reevaluate that. Mm -hmm. And so I left. And I thought, uh, I never shut the door, but I thought, no, I'll never be back. Once the whale coughed me up, <laughs> I realized that God, had, that God had given me so many blessings in this time outside of the seminary, so much encouragement to uh, send me back in that direction uh, with my pastor. I talked to my pastor and discovered he had done the same thing. In his mm. sophomore year of college seminary, he left for a year and went back. <laughs> and he told me, no matter what, I'm always going to consider you a seminarian because I believe you'll be back. Uh, he gave me uh, a vocation director, which was happy to... Uh, to be understanding and to invite me to live in the Fiat House, which is a house of discernment for men considering priesthood, mm -hmm. and invite me in there to uh, reevaluate and to reassure myself about my vocation. Uh, my friends from the seminary who are watching tonight are, were, were singularly helpful. Uh, my friends at home were very helpful, uh, even secular, uh, non-Christian yeah. friends. Uh, some of my friends are in a, in a rock band called Good For Nothing, and they invited <laughs> me to work with them to sing and write songs for them and gave me freedom to express myself in all sorts of religious imagery. And I tell you, Marcus, uh, we probably wrote the only punk rock song about Oscar Romero that's ever, <laughs> that's ever been written. Um, uh, and I, I'm thankful to have them, to have uh, my, my best friend, Candace, who's, who's loving support and, and confidence in me, has really retaught me what it is to love with the, yeah. with the Sacred Heart of Christ. And my bishop, Bishop Image of Joliet, who sat me down at dinner once and I said, Bishop, uh, I think God's got the wrong guy. I think he's made a mistake. And he looked at me and he said, Jeff, God doesn't make mistakes. I didn't believe him at first, but, but now I do. And so uh, everything, everything is in order now, and I'll, I'll resume my studies in the fall. We know I left seminary after year two. So it Did you? <laughs> yes, oh yes. Because often you, you get into it, and then uh, I, I looked back and I considered it a time of you're into it, uh, which often involves leaving a lot of things behind, as it mm -hmm. did for me, my engineering career, and then I went to seminary, and then after a year, I needed that time to step back, yeah. even to the point where I say, I'm never going back, to truly examine where my heart was, and then went back after a year, just like you're mm -hmm. talking about, too. And it, it helps to regain uh, the focus that you're there to be a channel of God's love. That's right. And that becomes a driving force in your life, and it's amazing. It's also sometimes called, what John of the Cross entitles, The Dark Night yeah. of the Soul, where he... Uh, is drawing us closer and sometimes in dry times. Mm -hmm. And I can at least vouch for the fact that as an evangelical, I did not understand fully the dry times right. of the prayer journey. You know, mm -hmm. it's what's wrong with me, as opposed to understanding it as it might, I might be exactly where God wants me right. to be at that dark right. time. Our theme for tonight is the church in the Old Testament. So right. let's take a little bit of time. Okay. Uh, you're going to run us through some of the things you discovered that led you to right. have this open your heart to the Catholic Church. So how do we understand the church in the Old Testament? Okay. Well, one of the most basic principles of reading the scripture from the ancient church on to today is that we read the Old Testament in light of Jesus Christ. Now someone might object, well that's not the most critical way to, uh, to read the Old Testament. And that's true, it's not the historical critical method, which is all well and good to read the Bible as literature and to find out what they meant when they wrote it, uh, the, the social and political and everything that went into it. 
But if, if we as Christians take seriously the doctrine of inspiration of Scripture, we have to take it a step further than that mm -hmm. and try to find Christ in everything we read in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes that's hard, sometimes that's difficult. It depends on the passage. But if you look in the Old Testament, you see a continual development of God's plan of salvation uh, from going all the way back to Adam. When Adam and Eve committed the first sin and when, the, when the mankind fell and were cast out of the garden and cursed, God said that he would raise up, mm -hmm. he would raise up the, uh, the son of Eve yeah. and that the son of Eve would strike the head of the serpent and, and the serpent would of course strike his heel. And there we have Christ from the very beginning figured in the Old Testament. Now the next, the very next time that the scriptures speak about Christ, we find the church. And that's in Genesis chapter 12, when God promises uh, Abraham that he would create a great nation out of his descendants, that he would give him the land of promise. And in Genesis 12, verses 2 and 3, that all the nations of the earth would be blessed through Abraham. Here we have the calling together of the people of every nation under the earth. Now this was even before the time of Moses. We already have the church prefigured. Not simply a chosen people, one nation, as Israel was under the Old Covenant, mm -hmm. but the entire earth under the reign of, of God. And so it continues with uh, Judah. When uh, the patriarch Jacob was on his deathbed giving blessings to all of his children, he blessed Judah and said, uh, and, and prophesied that Judah would reign over all his brothers and over every nation of the earth. And of course, Christ came from the tribe of Judah, is known as the Lion of the tribe of Judah, and that mm -hmm. comes from that passage in Genesis 59. Uh, so again, we see all nations of the earth gathered together under the reign of Christ. Mm -hmm. Now we know that the kingdom of God will find its ultimate fulfillment in the end. When, uh, when history ends, when the world is consummated, when everyone enters into uh, eternal heaven. However, the church is not just a, something to pass the time until mm -hmm. the kingdom is fulfilled. It is the kingdom fulfilled not in completion, but in reality. Mm -hmm. And that continues throughout the scriptures. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, uh, God prophesies to David that one of his descendants will rule over all the nations of the earth and that that kingdom will last forever. So we see here the indefectibility of the church. Church isn't going anywhere. God calls people from every nation into one family, one kingdom, and he does it for a reason, and he's not going to let it mm -hmm. slip. Uh, after David, we get into the prophets. Of the prophet Isaiah, there is quite a bit of imagery about the church. And I want to look at one passage in particular, Isaiah chapter 59. In Isaiah chapter 59... God speaks about the coming of the Messiah, and he says, Those in the west shall fear the name of the Lord, and those in the east his glory. For it shall come like a pent-up river, which the breath of the Lord drives on. He shall come to Zion, a redeemer, to those of Jacob who turn from sin, says the Lord. This is the covenant with them which I myself have made, says the Lord. My spirit which is upon you, and my words that I have put into your mouth, shall never leave your mouth, nor the mouths of your children, nor the mouths of your children's children from now on and forever, says the Lord. Rise up in splendor, your light has come, the glory of the Lord shines upon you. We see very clearly that bringing together of people from all nations into one family and one kingdom, which we could describe as universal, and in doing so we describe as Catholic, is part of God's plan and has been from the very beginning. Uh, you also find this in Isaiah chapter 7, in Isaiah chapter 9, uh, Micah 5, Zechariah 9, Daniel chapter 2, which is another beautiful one. And you I know, might say here, I don't mean to, to stop, but those of you who are watching, if you wonder, where am I going to find these verses? Well, you have a website, right? Right. Where they can probably check if they want to get some of this information. Right. Great. It's uh, www.catholichost.com slash ccc, Catholic host, all one word. Okay. You find all this there. Right. Uh, Prophet Daniel was, uh, was captive in Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream where he, uh, he saw a, a great beast made of different parts, and these parts represented four kingdoms. Mm -hmm. uh, and scholars would tell us that these were Babylon, Medo-Persia, uh, Greece, and Rome. Okay? Now, Daniel interprets this dream, tells him about the kingdoms, and then says, in the days of the fourth kingdom, in the days of the kings of Rome, the Lord will establish his kingdom on the earth, and his kingdom will last forever. Now, in Daniel chapter 7, <laughs> in Daniel chapter 7, he goes even further. He again speaks about the coming of the Messiah and the establishment of the kingdom uh, during the time of the, Roman, of the Roman Empire. And he goes on to say that the holy people of the Most High will rule forever. See, it's all about the community. There is always to be a community of faithful people. Because mm. some people will say, well, 
I know the church is never supposed to fall away, but as long as we've got the seed of the church in the Bible, well, you know, even if nobody believes it, even if there's no practicing Christians at the time, which we would have said in the Church of Christ, that there were no Christians from the, whenever the falling away happened to be and uh, the, the Campbell and Stone movement in the 1830s. Um, God doesn't say so. God says that my words will remain with, your, with you and your children through every generation, that dominion will never be taken away from, mm -hmm. from my holy people. Um, so what the, the other thing that I found, the other thing that I found very interesting, not only is there the community in the Old Testament, there's also a certain part of the community uh, which is chosen to be sacrificial priesthood. Okay. Now this really came as a surprise to me and I thought, well, no, this can't possibly be because from my background, the idea of a continuing sacrificial priesthood was so anachronistic, mm -hmm. uh, such, such an anticlimax after the priesthood of Christ a as to be you know, almost blasphemous to suggest. Mm -hmm. But you find in the prophets of the Old Testament that there would indeed be such a sacrificial priesthood. I want to take a look at a quick passage in Jeremiah chapter 33. Hope you're turning very quickly in your pages to find this passage, everyone. But <laughs> again, you can check his website. If, uh, if you... What is it again? Jeremiah chapter 33. Right. Uh, in verses 14 through 18, he, the prophet <coughs> echoes uh, some of the other prophecies we referred to in the one that we read, where God would establish a, a family and a kingdom among all the nations of the earth, and that it would never fall away. Uh, but then he goes a little further. In those days, Judah shall be safe, and Jerusalem shall dwell secure. And now we know that Judah and Jerusalem are code words for the church in Old Testament prophecy. We are the new Jerusalem. This is what they shall call her. The Lord is our justice. For thus says the Lord, never shall David lack a successor on the throne of the house of Israel, nor shall priests of Levi ever be lacking to offer a holocaust before me. Uh -huh. You find that echoed again in Isaiah chapter 66, verses 18 through 23. Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 15, where he goes so far as to say they shall drink wine like blood. And Malachi chapter 1 and verse 11, a very famous passage which speaks of perpetual sacrifice being offered uh, all in every nation under the sun. That's right. So we see these images. And the sad thing is that, like you said, on one hand, um, it's because of your presuppositions about how we take the Old Testament as to whether a person might be open to see these images. If, for, if you're only looking for Christ, you might pass all those up, or you might, if you presume that the church began with Christ's words, let's say in Matthew 16 or something, then you may not even look for it in the Old Testament. Right. Or you might presume that uh, with the rejection of the Jews of the gospel, that there's this break. But it doesn't say that there's that break anywhere in the New Testament, right. does it? It's, it's continuous. There is but one, one church, and uh, the earth was founded for it, some of the fathers will tell Compare us. Compare that briefly, if you would, to the, your understanding of the church that you grew up with versus oh, the way we understand it as Catholics. It's, it's, it's worlds apart. It's worlds apart uh, the, in, in, in many non-Catholic ways of thought. The church today is something totally separate from, from the, the Jewish church, and it has no connection yeah. to it. And the church today will end, and, and to some people, uh, the Jews will be the, the Jews will regain their covenant. Now, that's not to say that God ever rejected the Jews, because right. we know that God has not rejected the Jews. John right. Paul II has been very clear on that. Right. However, um, there is but one, but one uh, family. When John nations. Paul continues to call us towards unity, he's calling for a bringing together of all people under God right. into this body. Well, let me ask you this, uh, another large way that many non-Catholics interpret the understanding of church is this invisible church. Mm -hmm. Do you see that fitting these categories? Oh, the invisible church certainly doesn't uh, fit with what we found in the prophets. Now, there is some truth to it because the church is a mystery by nature. Yeah. And there is much more to the church than the institutional structures we have, which is why they have developed and changed throughout the years. Uh, the church is not simply the clergy. The church is not simply the institution we know today. Uh, the church is the body of Christ. St. Paul says in Ephesians, the fullness of him who fills all things. Now that's powerful language yeah. about the church. And which, of course, you don't have time to do here, but as you mentioned in your journey, the early fathers became a new witness to you to, to the history of the church. So if you take what you had in the Old Testament, show its continuity through the New Testament, and then you look at what the early church fathers say, 
I mean, there we see the growth of the institutional church in the hierarchy of the church right. following and fulfilling what Christ had established in the apostles and Peter. Right. We're going to take a break. Back just a moment with your questions for Jeff Childers as he talks about many issues, anything you'd like to talk about, but specifically this issue, particularly this issue on church in the Old Testament. Welcome back to The Journey Home. My guest this evening is Jeff Childers. The theme for tonight was uh, his own discovery of the church in the Old Testament, and he's given us a nice little lesson on that. We usually don't have the time for that, but I wanted him to do that because it pulled together a lot of ideas. I also want him to do that because, especially those of you who love studying Scripture and, and uh, may not have considered this, he's given you a lot of data to examine, and I think very convincing data. Uh, let's begin with our first email. This is from Robert in Dayton, Marcus and Jeff. Can you share a question or two that a Catholic can ask a member of the Church of Christ that will point to the truth of the Catholic Church? Begin, if you would, another summary of the Church of Christ, because many people may not be familiar. They might think, aren't we all Churches of Christ? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, but this particular issue is any specific questions? Okay. Well, uh, the Church of Christ, very quickly, uh, grew out of the Restoration Movement in the 1800s under Alexander Campbell and Barton Warren Stone, which was a movement to unite Christians of all denominations uh, together in one church and to base that union solely on the Bible, so okay. the Scriptura. Right. Um, what happened is the movement became very <coughs> divisive, and you have your Disciples of Christ, the Christian Church, and the Church of Christ broke off, and then the Church of Christ itself broke and splintered into several okay. different groups. Uh, a question I would ask, I mean, w without, without looking like you're going on the offensive and trying to attack the, the people, because I w wouldn't want to do that, but, but I would say, um, if, if Jesus Christ gave the apostles the gift of infallibility so that they could preach the truth to their generation, why don't you think that the church today would have it? Don't you think that the second generation of Christians, third, fourth, and ten thousandth generation of Christians is every bit as important to our blessed Lord as the first generation of Christians. Mm -hmm. And that may turn, turn them to look, well, where can I find this gift of infallibility? Where can I find these yeah. teachers who are not just qualified by the holiness of their lives as the men in the Church of Christ are, but mm -hmm. are qualified with uh, actual authority, actual divinely mm -hmm. ordained authority? You know, tie in with that, the promise of Scripture that the prayers of a righteous man are answered. And there's no more righteous man than Jesus. Right, right. And his prayers over his apostles is their issue of unity. He asked that the Spirit would be given them, that they'd be led into all truth, that they would remember what he had told, all those prayers. Well, hey, I mean, the prayers of a righteous man, there we have Jesus. Mm -hmm. Well, the idea that the church just completely fell away right away would put some major questions on the right. validity of his prayers right. answered. All right, let's take our first caller. It's Monica from Pennsylvania. Hello. What's your question for us? Hi, Marcus. I wanted to thank you for all the hard work you've been doing. It's a wonderful show you have. Thank you, Monica. And uh, Jeff, welcome to the Catholic Church. Well, thank you. We need more people like you. <laughs> <laughs> My question is, how did your family, friends, and the people from your former congregation respond to your uh, conversion? Did anybody challenge you? I'm sure they all did. <laughs> Thank you, Monica. Well, my family for the most part has been uh, supportive of me in that uh, they feel that whatever makes me, makes me happy is, is fine with them. It was particularly hard on my grandfather and it was very hard for me to make the decision because I knew it would be because I love mm. and respect the man so much. Mm. Uh, he taught me everything I know about the Christian faith and I knew he would think I was rejecting what he handed on to me even though I wasn't. I was simply fulfilling what he handed on to me. Uh, doing what he would have done if he came across the same conclusions that I had. Mm -hmm. uh, try telling him that. Uh, <laughs> although he has still been very personally supportive of me. As far as members of the old congregation, 
right, right at first, quite a few did call me up and want to have Bible studies with me, and, and I did for, did for a while. Um, some of them eventually backed off. I backed out of a couple because it just so time consuming to be studying with, with, with all those people, but they cared about me so much. In the, in, the, in the years that have followed, I haven't heard from very many, many of them. There's a couple older couples that will still call me over for lunch or whatnot, but uh, most, of them, most of them I don't hear from anymore, and that's kind of hard because you know, the, yeah. that small church was really a family to me. Yeah. And it is hard. You know, I know that in my own life, it's hard to get our family mm -hmm. and, and friends to hear us. Sometimes you just wonder why they can't hear the, what I think is so such clear evidence both in Scripture, Old and New Testament, the early fathers, all the way on through. I mean, I understand that what stands be, be between most people in the Catholic Church are issues of ignorance. They just don't have the data mm -hmm. or prejudice. What they think is true is wrong, but they can't get beyond that. Or maybe they've had bad examples in their life of Catholics that are not perfect. Right. That's me. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> or sometimes it's pride. Even if they recognize some things, saying that they might be wrong is difficult. So we need to pray for people like that, right. that the Lord would open, right. you know, open an interest. Right. In and, and, and at the same time, I'm continually humbled uh, because becoming part of the Catholic Church was a major step on my journey toward salvation. But I look at people who haven't made that step and see that they're further along on their yeah. journeys than I am, holier than I am, more knowledgeable than I am. Right. And, and that's very humbling too. Right, right. And we're so thankful for the witness of those that brought us to Christ right. long ago. Let's take our next email. It's Beverly from Johnst Johnston, Rhode Island. Uh, dear Marcus and Jeff, would you please explain, if you can, why we as Catholics have seven plus books more than the Protestants do in our Bible? Who decided which books would be included or excluded? Thank you for your wonderful testimony and witness. And you mentioned that earlier. But yeah. Uh, the, Catholic, the Catholic Old Testament is, is longer because the ancient Old Testament was longer. When the Old Testament was first translated into, into the Greek language about 200 years before Christ in the Septuagint translation, it included everything that is included in our Catholic mm -hmm. Bible. After the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, uh, the Jews wanted to, to reclaim a sense of identity because they'd lost their temple and their priesthood, so that they clung to their Hebrew language. Some of those seven books were not originally thought to have been composed in Hebrew, so the rabbis met in 95 AD at the Council of Jamea and removed those books from the scripture. Um, Christians continued to keep them till later on. Uh, some of the reformers, uh, Martin Luther, John Calvin, removed them for various reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, some say because you see Catholic doctrine reflected in them, and in a sense that's true. You see free will, you see uh, purgatory, veneration of saints, things like that. Uh, but mostly it was probably more intellectually honest than that. They wanted to keep Hebrew books in the yeah. Bible. The Renaissance had brought up, um, uh, reintroduced an interest in the study of the original languages. Right. And that was one of the main uh, issues there. Uh, one thing that's also interesting on this issue to know is that when you study the New Testament and you realize that in the New Testament, often when you find a direct quote from the Old Testament, if you're comparing it to Old Testament that's translated from the Hebrew, they don't match. Right, right. And that's strong proof that the early Christians used the Greek. Right. Because that's out of which the quotes were taken for the early Greek scriptures. Mm -hmm. So we know that that's what the early Christians used. Let's take our first caller. It's Isabel from New York. Hello, Isabel. Hi, thank you for taking my call. What's your question? Um, I have a question, and, and that is um, a lot of my friends who are non-Catholics can't understand how we can pray to someone who has died. That's including the saints sure. and the Blessed Mother. And I was wondering, uh, as Catholics, how, do, how did we decide that it was okay to do that? <laughs> um, is it scriptural or is it you know, coming from somewhere else? Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, it is scriptural. I mean, you see in the book of Revelation, you see when St. John has his vision of heaven, uh, he witnesses the elders, uh, which are the 12 patriarchs of Israel and the 12 apostles, uh, who had gone before him because there were 14 apostles in, in, in total. Um, the 12 apostles who had gone before him presenting the prayers of the faithful to God and also the angels of God presenting the prayers of the faithful to God like bowls of incense. Uh, what we do when we speak to either a canonized saint uh, or, or, or someone who, who's, who's blessed or you know even even someone who's meant a lot to us That's you know right. personally who will never be recognized by the church at large we are asking them to pray with us. And so if I pray to St. Peter, 
Uh, St. Peter and I pray together in the name of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That's right. And just like that image, they're presenting those. Right. And in fact, that's a, that is the issue that underlies our understanding of praying to Mary. You know, we often get that question. I mean, I'm, I was mm -hmm. wondering how, you, how did Mary, how was Mary as an issue in your own journey? Um, well, I struggled with it at, at first. You know, once I came to these conclusions about the establishment of the church and whatnot, I still had all the usual objections. What about Mary? What about statues? What about purgatory? But uh, it, it, it came pretty quickly to me once I accepted uh, the, both the authority of the church and, more important, the church as a community uh, sharing in God's love. Yeah. And that uh, Mary, as the exemplar of that church, as the one chosen by Christ to be his mother, and that she deserves honor for that. That's right. And so once you understand the communion of saints, as we do as Catholics, then the, asking them to assist us in our prayers makes all the sense in the world. Right. And it's both scriptural and traditional. And again, if you, know, you can see that idea flowing all the way through the, the early churches. You know, one thing that came to my mind as you were sharing your own journey, which was such a connection to so many converts that I know. Mm -hmm. And that is this time of no man's land. I'm not sure if it came across uh, as clear now as when you and I talked this afternoon. And that is that an awful, awful high percentage of converts go through the early stages of just being interested and then becoming convinced and struggling mm -hmm. with that. But then at some point, it hits them what the implications of this are going to mean. And so there's that time of no man land. Talk a little bit about that, because that's very common. Oh, yeah, I certainly experienced that. And I tell you, it was terrifying. I spent a long time, you know, on my knees in prayer about that one, because there was a point where I knew I had to do something. But I wasn't ready to become a Catholic, you know. And, and I could have, you know, I've, I, f I felt it would have been disrespectful to, to the Orthodox Church or Anglican Church to join them because I didn't want to be Catholic. What reason is that? So, uh, you know, I'm in this point where I have to make a move. I don't want to make a move. I'm comfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, I, could, I could work as in ministry in full time within just a couple of years and do pretty well for myself and have a family and everything. Uh, instead, I'm stepping out. I, I don't know many Catholics personally. Uh, I've never been inside a Catholic yeah. church. Um, I don't want to do this. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, the, part of the reason I wanted to ask that is that I want the audience to understand that this is an issue that uh, is very Im significant, mm -hmm. that cuts deep at the core of our vocation. I remember you were sharing with me how during those last times when y you knew that you were eventually going to head to the church, you were convicted in your heart, but because of the situation at your church, you had to continue right. ministering. Right, there was a time where I was employed uh, you know, running, running the, the office in the church and, and preaching and doing Bible studies when we didn't have another full-time preacher. Uh, so I couldn't just up and leave the church, you know, with, without a preacher uh, until the new preacher came. And at the same time, I had to be very careful because I, I couldn't abuse the, the trust they gave me and get up in the pulpit and teach Catholicism in the Church of Christ. But at the same time, I had to teach things which didn't go against yeah. my, my new convictions as a Catholic. Oh, was very difficult. And I remember when I told my grandfather, when I told mm -hmm. my grandfather about my decision a week before I left the Church of Christ, that's how long it took me to tell him, I sat in his uh, living room chair and I shook for three hours before I could, before I could get the strength to, uh, to, to mumble it out. Yeah. yeah. Um, this, I, you know, in fact, I asked those of you watching who've followed the journey home now, we're in our fourth year to offer a prayer, especially for the men and women who are in that difficult position even now. You know, I think of, of men who are serving as Lutheran, Presbyterian, Baptist, Methodist, Episcopalian ministers. Uh, they've become convinced in their heart that they ought to come into the fullness, but given their family situation or given their vocational needs, they can at the present moment. They're ready to jump, they're working it through, but it's rough. And uh, weekly and often daily, they go through great struggles. So let's keep them in prayer. Let's take this next email. Okay. Dear Marcus and Jeff, I have a relative who joined the Church of Christ after marrying a girl who was a Church of Christ member. He had been baptized Catholic as an infant. From your special insight as a former Church of Christ member, Jeff, please give us some guidance as 
to especially meaningful Bible verses that we could share with him and his family to open his heart to returning to the Roman Catholic Church? Or are we better off to let him continue where he is, obviously happy as a Church of Christ member? Oh. Well, you don't want to attack him. You don't want to try to bludgeon him to death with the Catechism of the Catholic Church. <laughs> what you do want to do is set an example for him. Show him that you are a Catholic who is a committed Christian, who just exudes God's love. You know, because a lot of people in the Church of Christ don't believe that Catholics are Christians, don't believe anyone is a Christian outside of their own church. And uh, even more important than bringing them out of that church is to open them up to the fact that they've got brothers and sisters who were there to uh, join with them in the journey. Now, if you want meaningful Bible verses, you know, especially if he goes attacking the Catholic Church, well, there's many of the ones I quoted tonight, Isaiah chapter 59, Daniel chapter 2, there's Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, uh, 1 Timothy 3:15. Uh, a, a slew of others. I would say go to the website. Go to the website. I have a whole section dedicated specifically that to That was CatholicHost.com? CatholicHost.com slash CCC. Okay. Now, this is one of the verses I was thinking about. You know, are, would you say that the Church of Christ folk are the kind of people that would say, show it to me in the Bible? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Book, chapter, and verse. They, they, uh, Barton Warren Stone, an early member. No, it was Thomas Campbell said, we speak where the Bible speaks and we're silent where the Bible is silent. Right. And they live and they die by that. So it sounds like, first of all, it would be good, good to memorize that quote from him. Right, Thomas right? Campbell. And then ask, where in the Bible does it show you that i got to show it to you in the Bible? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean... Would that be a, a, that, that, a challenging issue for them? That would be a challenging is issue because all of a sudden you open up the question of, well, how do we know what the Bible is? We've got 27 separate letters, uh, some of which are even uh, anonymous letters. The Gospels are, aren't even signed. Um, how do you know that, it's, that those 27 and only those are the revealed will of God? And however you answer that question, whatever authority you use to answer that question, it's not the Bible. You've got to violate your own rule. Yeah. to put a Bible together. That's right. And most of them don't see that. What, what, would, what do you think they mostly would do? Just, just, uh, would they mostly turn to, what, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, and mm -hmm. all Scripture? Uh, is, the, but then you just say, well, why is this the Scripture that it refers to? Right. You, you, there's a danger of running up into a brick wall uh, with that, as there is with any argument. Yeah. So try that, try that, but most importantly, pray and yeah. set a good example. And love them. you got to love them. Let's take this next email, Sandra from uh, Louisiana, Jeff and Marcus. I am not a Catholic and I have never understood why Catholics confess to a priest. Jeff, how did you come to terms with this practice? Um, well, the first thing it took for me to come to terms with it because of my Church of Christ background was to discover that it was biblical. In John chapter 20, uh, Jesus, Jesus lays his hands on the, on the apostles. He breathes the Holy Spirit on them. He says, receive the Holy Spirit. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven them. Whose sins you retain are retained. St. Paul says that he has a ministry of reconciliation. And he says, whoever sins I forgive, I forgave it in the person of Christ. Um, that's how I first came to terms with it. Yeah. All right, thank you. Time flies. We're having fun. One last sure question. Does. Talk about, if you would, how becoming a Catholic has drawn you closer to Jesus. Oh, where to, where to begin? As a Catholic, as someone who really understands and appreciates the Incarnation, that Jesus Christ became a man, I've been able to discover that everything that exists, all creation, is a channel of God's love. We're special as human beings because we can be conscious channels of God's love. Mm -hmm. And we can turn the faucet up or turn the faucet down. We can never shut it off. <laughs> Every person is a channel of God's love, even the worst of them. Gandhi's a channel of God's love, and Hitler's a channel of God's love when he passed the butter across the dinner table, you know. <laughs> but uh, as Christians, we know why we are channels of God's love, because we're following in the footsteps of Christ, and uh, especially those of us who, who feel called to the priesthood. We've got to follow, we've got to walk in Christ's shoes, and it's not always easy. Mm. They can be cruel shoes to walk in. Mm. Uh, and we're given wills to determine how to use the channels that we've been made to be. Right. As you mentioned, images of people that don't always use the channels very faithfully. Right. We have responsibility and a freedom to do that. Right. And God's grace not only flows through us, but enables us right. to open right. those channels to others. And, and to live a life of God's love is just amazing. It's just, uh, it's just awe-inspiring. I have nothing, I, I can't even, I don't dare speak about it. Words fail. <laughs> Jeff, thank you very much. Thank you, Marcus. For joining us on the journey home, and God bless you. Thank you. In your, in your journey, uh, in call to the priesthood.
you know, we look forward to hearing about it in the future. Thank have you. Have you back on here and let us, next time, maybe you're here, you have a little white collar, or <laughs> uh, white collar now with us uh, as you represent Christ as those that are called for the sacrifice. Well, thank, thank you, Marcus. You. Stay with us in a moment. We'll be back for some closing words for the journey home. Welcome back. Jeff, this evening, uh, led us through a very challenging summary of the Old Testament understanding of the church. I'd like to close tonight by reading a couple paragraphs from the Catechism, in which th the New Catechism directs us to this very issue. I'm reading from paragraphs 759 and 760. So you might want to mark these in your Catechism and listen to what the church says about the meaning of the church. The Eternal Father, in accordance with the utterly gratuitous and mysterious design of his wisdom and goodness, created the whole universe and chose to raise up men to share in his own divine life, to which he calls all men in his Son. The Father determined to call together in a holy church those who should believe in Christ. This family of God is gradually formed and takes shape during the stages of human history in keeping with the Father's plan. In fact, Already present in figure at the beginning of the world, this church was prepared in marvelous fashion in the history of the people of Israel and the old alliance. Established in this last age of the world and made manifest in the outpouring of the Spirit, it will be brought to glorious completion at the end of time. Here we see the church describing itself as a fulfillment of what was uh, formed in the Old Testament and then we are trying to live out by the grace of God. Now, it also says earlier, and I want to quickly get this in, that the word church is the Latin word for the Greek word ecclesia. It means a convocation or assembly. Ecclesia is used frequently in the Greek Old Testament, that's the Septuagint you're referring to, for the assembly of the chosen people before God, above all for their assembly on Mount Sinai. By calling itself church, the first community of Christian believers recognized itself as heir to that assembly. In the church, God is calling together his people from all ends of the earth. The point is that when the early church understood itself as following Christ, it specifically chose the word ecclesia, which was the word in the Old Testament that defined the people of God. So it's a very conscious understanding that the church is, in fact, this continuous fulfillment of the people that God had called to be his followers. You see, this idea that it's just Jesus and me is a modern invention. It rejects the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the early church father and the continuing church teaching of the understanding of the church as the people of God established by Christ in his apostles, fulfilling that Old Testament image. The idea of being a Catholic is not adding on to Jesus. It's accepting all that Jesus gave us. He said, go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them all that I have given to you. All. Being a Catholic means the fullness of Christ. And so that's our challenge to you. And that's why we have the Journey Home program. To try and present to you the fullness so you can fully follow, follow Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. God bless you as we do this together.